Welcome everyone to Civics 101, how to fight back against voter suppression. Um, we are so excited to have uh, all of you here with us today. And uh, we are also hosting a film festival. And next Wednesday, uh, we are hosting uh, a panel on the film Rigged. Um, it's about uh, voter suppression. So if you enjoy the program today, absolutely check out our website at equaldignity.org and you will uh, get the information to screen the film before the panel. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Kimberly Ellis. Uh, she is affectionately known as Dr. Goddess. Uh, she is a scholar of American and Africa, Africana studies, an artist, activist, and entrepreneur, as well as a playwright, world traveler, and international thought leader on culture, gender, and social technology. She is also the founder of the Civic Tech Project, hashtag Black Politics Matter, the co-founder of uh, hashtag Ask a Sista, the author of the upcoming book, The Bombastic Brilliance of Black Twitter, the creator of a Trip Off the Old Block, chronicling her world travels and group trips. She's also the producer of You're Beautiful to Me, a feature documentary film chronicling the journey with her mother's dementia. Uh, Dr. Ellis, thank you so much for moderating this panel today, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Cameron. You're so welcome, and welcome to all of you who are ready to fight against voter suppression. Thank you so much for being here. We're so proud of you, and uh, it is a delight for me to introduce our uh, two panelists today, and they are both dynamic women doing wonderful things, and um, so uh, let me just start off with a uh, state senator and hopefully upcoming Congresswoman <laughs> Nakima Williams. Uh, senator Nakima Williams has been a fearless advocate for women and families throughout her life. Since her election to represent Georgia's 39th Senate District, which includes the cities of Atlanta, East Point, College Park, Union City, and South Fulton, Senator Nakima Williams has led the charge to improve her community and fight for the values of her constituents. She has spent her time at the state legislature fighting for working families, voting rights, fair representation, and much more. These values are reflected in her work as a serving member of the influential Economic Development and Tourism, Retirement, MARTOC, State and Local Government Operations, Urban Affairs, and Special Judiciary Committees. Yet for Senator Williams, the fight for a more prosperous Georgia does not end at the state legislature. As the first black woman chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia, she leads the fight statewide to expand across, I'm sorry, to expand access to opportunity for Georgians. Senator Williams plays a key role in the National Democratic Party as a member of the executive and resolution committees of the Democratic National Committee. Senator Williams' commitment to Georgians is also reflected in her arduous fight for free and fair elections. From speaking out against voter suppression to ensuring that every individual's vote is counted, Senator Williams will not stop until everyone's voices are heard. In fact, in November of 2018, Senator Williams was arrested at the state capitol as she stood by her constituents to elevate their demands that every vote be counted following the midterm elections. Welcome State Senator Nakima Williams. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Our second panelist is also another dynamic woman. Jennifer Lamson is the de Deputy Director of the Democracy Initiative. Jennifer has more than 25 years of experience leading, managing, and advising progressive issue campaigns at the local, national, and international levels. She specializes in designing and implementing advocacy and public engagement strategies that build political will through coalition building, strategic communications, and grassroots and grass tops organizing. I love that. At the Pew Charitable Trust, Jennifer oversaw the International Boreal Cons Conservation Campaign, otherwise known as the IBCC, a long-running coalition and their largest land conservation effort. Under Jennifer's leadership, IBCC backed and galvanized robust support for indigenous-led advocacy efforts that secured historic new federal investment in indigenous land management as a key conservation strategy. 
Operationally, Jennifer overhauled IBCC's annual strategic planning and budgeting processes to ensure alignment with the campaign's strategic objectives and rebuild IBCC's strategic communications program. As you all see, we have two dynamic women on this panel. So uh, I wanted to get started with questions and basically how this will happen um, for the audience and for our panelists is I'm gonna ask some questions directly to both Senator Williams and Jennifer Lamson. And then we're, uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna look at a clip first of uh, John Lewis and, um, and his historic role. We'll watch that first. And then we'll ask some questions of the panelists and then we will get to audience questions, okay? Everybody ready to go? All right, good. Let's watch this clip about John Lewis. People, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is still needed. Especially Section 5, it is the heart and soul of the Voting Rights Act. If you declare or make that act, that section illegal, there is a tendency, there will be a great tendency on the part of many parts of the American South and other parts of our country to go back. We've come too far. We've made too much progress in the past 48 years to go back. Those of us that participated in that effort to gain the right to vote, we take it very personal. I take it personal. On that attempted to march from Selma to Montgomery, to dramatize to the state of Alabama and to the nation that we wanted to participate, that we wanted all people to participate in the democratic process. Almost died on that bridge. I gave a little blood. And some of the individuals that I work with, that I got to know, didn't make it, didn't survive. I will never forget the three civil rights workers, Andy Goodman, Micah Scherner, and James Shaney. Two young white Americans from New York, and one young black American from Mississippi. And I tell young people all the time, they didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East. They didn't die in Central or South America. They didn't die in Eastern Europe. They died right here in our own country, trying to open up the political process. And that's why I said today, this effort, this act was won by an unbelievable struggle over the death and the shedding of blood of so many people. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a, a very powerful clip from uh, the late and great John Lewis, um, who lied in state, as you all know, uh, following his passing and had an amazing, amazing home going uh, in so many different ways. Um, and we are here in honor of him and in honor of all those who gave their lives and their sacrifices for the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and for those who are fighting against voter suppression today. Um, State Senator Williams, I want to start off with you. And if you would uh, do us all a favor, I have a question for you specifically about the Voting Rights Act and the legacy of John Lewis, but you are actually a living legacy of John Lewis. Can you explain to us briefly, uh, how we get you from State Senator Nakima Williams to Congresswoman Nakima Williams. So um, thank you, Dr. Ellis, for the question, because there's been a lot of confusion around this. Um, I am currently a state senator, and my term ends in December of this year. However, after the passing of Congressman Lewis and the primary election had already happened, the state Democratic Party had the opportunity to replace his name on the ballot to ensure that we had a Democratic nominee. And I was very fortunate to be chosen by the state, um, the executive committee of the state Democratic Party as the Democratic nominee for the 5th Congressional District. And so my name will replace Congressman Lewis's name on the November ballot. Thank you so much. That's so powerful. 
So State Senator and future Congresswoman Williams, can you talk to our audience about why the Voting Rights Act was so important in 1965 when it was signed into law? and especially why it was so important to Congressman John Lewis. So Dr. Ellis, just listening to that video um, sums it up of how important voting and voting rights was to Mr. Lewis. Um, he often talked about voting was the most um, powerful tool, the most powerful nonviolent tool that we had in a democratic society. And we had to keep fighting for this right to vote. And I was doing the quick calculations in my mind when he said 48 years ago that the Voting Rights Act passed. So that was filmed in 2013, the video that we just saw. And in 2013, was the year that the Supreme Court um, struck down a portion of the Voting Rights Act. And so Congressman Lewis um, for years worked to get our right to vote for Black Americans, especially in the Deep South. And when he talked about Section 5, that was such a critical part of the Voting Rights Act. And it wasn't quite struck down, Section 5, but um, Section 5 includes the preclearance portion of the Voting Rights Act. And in that, there's a formula that states in the Deep South, states that had a history of disenfranchising voters, states that had a history of keeping people like me and you from being able to cast their ballots, the very thing that Congressman Lewis bled on the Edmund Pettus Bridge for um, was no longer enforceable because of the coverage formula that was struck down by the Supreme Court. So when we look at what we need to do with the Voting Rights Act, I, um, people ask me, what is one of the things that I want to do when I get to Congress? And I just keep thinking about, I hope that it's done before I get there in January, because we do have a few more months before January. But if my future colleagues don't get it right, that is absolutely the first thing that I want to work on in passing a John Lewis Voting Rights Act to make sure that we not only restore pre-clearance section five in the coverage formula, but we have to take it another step further because we saw what has happened across this country, especially here in Georgia, since um, the 2013 Shelby Beholder decision. Yes, uh, thank you so much for explaining that. Um, Senator Williams was talking about the 2019 Supreme Court uh, vote and it was a 5-4 decision. Um, and she just explained Shelby versus Holder and what the, the pre-clearance means. But it, this is also a reminder, since we're talking about voter suppression, that your vote uh, leading up to November 3rd also affects the Supreme Court. Your vote matters on every single level and in every way. And she just explained to you an excellent reason as to why it matters with regard to the Supreme Court and the Voting Rights Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act that we hope to enact. We'll show you all a clip a little bit later um, that's relevant in that way. Um, in an article published on the Brennan Center's website, they write, quote, in his majority opinion, Chief Justice John Roberts argued that the coverage formula was no longer, quote, grounded in current conditions because, quote, the country has changed since the formula was first adopted in 1965. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in dissent observed that the country has changed precisely because of the effectiveness of the preclearance regime. She wrote that trashing preclearance was like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. What has happened to voting rights since this court ruling? Um, Jennifer, you can take that, or Senator, if you wanna follow up, you can take that as well. Jennifer, do you have something to share uh, with regard to what's happened to voting rights since th that court ruling? Yeah, I, I can jump in here, um, thank, thank you. Um, and I'll just, I'll just, I want to just say thanks for having me on this panel. I'm very honored to be here with you, um, Dr. Ellis, and with you, Senator, um, and and to be hosted by the this historic institution as well, talking about this generational struggle for voting rights. Um, the Democracy Initiative. We are a we are a coalition of 75 organizations, civil rights organizations, environmental groups, labor unions. Um, social justice groups and good government groups who have all unified um, around the issues of voting rights, money and politics, our democracy. Because all of our members, and we have a collective 45 million members, um, realize that we aren't going to make progress on any of the issues that we care about if we don't get this right. Um, so it's, it's 
it's voting rights, um, as everyone knows, is the cornerstone of our democracy. And it is the, the path to um, citizens having a, a seat at the governing table. So that's 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 where we come in. That's where we come into the fight, and we we bring an outside voice to these fights. And what we have been seeing um, since the Shelby decision um, is a massive surge in voter suppression policies across the country, um, and it, it's you know it's it's quite alarming, um, and it, and it's it's continuing today, um, and it's complicated further by the COVID crisis. Um, but since, you know, since the decision, we've seen 25 states put in new um, restrictions, um, things like re very restrictive voter ID laws, um, policies that make it harder for citizens to register to vote, um, making it more difficult to vote absentee, um, which is very important right now during the COVID, um, and and states making it harder for returning citizens who who have served time um, for felonies to to vote as well. Um, so when we look around the 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 voter suppression policies that we have seen an uptick in that we are concerned about are, as I mentioned, the voter ID laws, voter registration um, restrictions. Right now. During this COVID crisis, there are still 10 states where you cannot vote, register to vote online. That's a real problem. We're all sitting in our homes and um, being very careful about the decisions we make about when we're gonna when we're gonna risk our health to go outside. Um, there's also um, a lot of limitations on the windows in which you can register to vote. There are 20 states who let you register to vote on the same on the same day as election day. Everybody should have that. Um, but there's still no same day registration in 30 states. We see, and I'm sure Senator Williams could talk a lot more about this, the purges of the voting rolls. This has been used as a tool, um, a voter suppression tool where they go through and if you haven't voted in the last one or two elections, um, for whatever reason, they just dump you off the voter the voter rolls and without some kind of online way to check to see if you're still on the rolls it's it it it, it really is a is a is a is a, a burden and an obstacle to to voting um, another thing that we've seen a lot of happening pre covid and again during covid is closure of polling places not surprisingly this often happens in black and brown communities um, we call it strategic voter suppression. These are orchestrated mass suppression campaigns that are going on. They know what they are doing. They know where they're doing it. Um, between 2012 and 2018, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights put out a report and what they documented was 1,688 polling places were closed during those years. Um, We've seen even more of that happening during during COVID. Um, the absentee voting restrictions. One of the things that we are seeing right now, and I'm sure people are seeing it in the news, is with the 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 need, the COVID related need for more absentee voting. People are people are demanding the ability to vote by mail, um, to vote absentee. Um, in eight states, you still need an excuse to vote by absent vote by absentee ballot. Um, and in a number of those states, COVID, the COVID crisis is not an acceptable excuse. You have to document that you are going to be out of state or you're going to be away and absolutely physically unable to to um, that is that there is no excuse <laughs> for not <laughs> being able to vote absentee under these conditions. Um, Related to the surge, in one of the new um, methods of voter suppression, uh, orchestrated voter suppression that we are seeing, um, is uh, an effort from a na at the national level to mess with the United States Post Office. Um, there's an effort. Uh, they they have a they have a funding crunch at the post office, which is related to the COVID recession, um, and that has been used as a political football. Um, in Washington, D.C., um, because there's, you know, they, they're, they, 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 they want to keep people from voting by mail. Um, 
And, and now um, there have been some operational changes made at the post office that are resulting in an, in an intentional slowdown of, of delivery, um, which has also been quite openly um, described as connected to um, wanting to, to stop vote by mail. Um, so we're quite concerned about that as well. And then finally, I think we, we consider, um, you know, the right to vote is the cornerstone of our democracy and it is, um, it is the way that we, that we have a voice. Um, and there are a lot of efforts going on right now to sow chaos and confusion in the election period. There's efforts to delegitimize um, the results of this election already, even though we're um, still a couple of months away from um, election day. Um, there's been a huge surge in voting by mail across the country, I think, um, despite the fact that there have been some challenges in Georgia, there's a, been a huge surge in, in mail ballots in Georgia. That is, that is happening across the country and we, we are expecting, the experts are predicting that we're gonna see, because voters want to vote by mail this year, we're gonna see 70 to 80% of ballots cast by mail. So when you start to hear um, these um, false claims of um, vote by mail being, being more um, subject to fraud, uh, that is an effort to plant seeds of doubt about the legit legitimacy of the election. And it is, it is an attempt to, to violate that every vote counts and every vote should be counted, um, basic sort of tenet of our democracy. So I'll, I'll stop right there. Yes. Well, that was so much, Jennifer Lamson, and it is so, it's, it's horrific, um, but it's so important, the work that you all are doing, and to actually lay out what's happening, because I don't think that most people really understand all the different attacks, uh, you know, re relative to voter suppression. I mean, you sort of hear about the post office, right? But then you also, you hear about the post office also in relation to people saying, yeah, you know, I didn't get my package. <laughs> You know, it's not isolated uh, just to voter suppression, right? But really, that's the most important issue overall. We sort of hear about, you know, felons, you know, ex-felons uh, being able to uh, vote in Florida. And, we, and we, we see like little victories here and there in different states, but we don't understand fully that all-out assault. There is a all-out assault. And that's what I was hearing from you. Yeah. Um, so... All right, so now that we know the many different ways from the Supreme Court to the, the state and local levels where voter suppression is literally haunting us and threatening the, our, the, our very sense of democracy and this next election, Senator Williams, um, what are the ways to fight for and fight against these policies, I mean, these, these voter suppression tactics and fight for voting rights policies in order to benefit voters and make election administration more efficient. So as we have seen, and as you heard Jennifer mention, that we've had tremendous turnout in the elections this cycle already. And even that was even in primaries. In Georgia, we saw record numbers of people voting by mail in spite of all of the suppressive tactics that were used of people not getting their ballots mailed to them, of the long lines of waiting to vote early during our primary election. So I can only imagine what's to come in November. One of the biggest things that um, we can do to combat voter suppression is to keep voting. We have to make sure that we are still showing up in force. The more people vote, the more people are paying attention to what is happening in our democracy and in our system. The more our voices are heard about the issues that we're seeing. But then we have to make sure that we are electing people who are uplifting and voting to make sure that they are expanding the right to vote and access to the ballot box. What we're seeing here with the attacks on the post office and some of the other things that have been acted um, on the state and local level, these laws are put in place on the, in the state legislature. I saw day in and day out as there were things that were introduced that were meant to make it more difficult for people to vote. We had um, our Speaker of the House here in Georgia that said, if we have more people voting by mail, it would be bad for conservatives. And we cannot um, like sit back 
and think that they're not doing something about this. So that's where we come in. We have to make sure that we, like right now, there's, we've seen a shortage in poll workers, um, not just here in Georgia, but across the country, country because of the pandemic. So we need people signing up to be poll workers and poll watchers. We need people being election monitors and voter protection volunteers. There are organizations out there that are in the C3 space that are doing this. Um, and um, as the chairwoman of the Democratic Party, I welcome people to volunteer with us. We um, had the very first voter protection program in the country of any state Democratic Party, and we made it full full time year round and have expanded that program. But there are organizations like Fair Fight that are out there that are leading the way um, in states across the country, making sure that if you show up to vote, that your vote will be counted. We have to remind vigilant, remain vigilant, and make sure that we are protecting. Um, people and educating people on how to fill out their absentee ballot, when to fill it out, and what to do if they don't receive it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very good. And I, uh, we're going to uh, get very, very specific, especially because both of you have outlined uh, legal ways of voter suppression, practical ways of voter suppression, relative to the mail-in voting, the post office, uh, down the list. So, Let's take at least um, the impact of COVID and also mail-in voting, and then we can go down the list. And Jennifer, as, you, as we, um, so you'll be answering this question as well, but um, I want for people to be very, very clear about practical things that they can do to actually fight voter suppression wherever they are, right? So for both of you, um, especially, you, you both brought this up, but I just wanna ask you specifically, as a result of COVID-19, in-person voting is difficult due to social distancing, capacity restraints, and a shortage of poll workers, as you um, just talked about, Senator Williams. Such changes lead to longer lines, fewer open polling places, and more voters being disenfranchised due to early po poll closing times in some states. Combined with pre-existing voter suppression in states like Georgia, COVID-19 could disenfranchise thousands of voters in the upcoming election. So we'll start off with you, Senator Williams, and then we'll go to Jennifer. How can we ensure Americans can safely vote this year in this election? So what right now, Georgia has no excuse absentee voting, and that is vote by mail. We need to make sure that we're clear that voting by mail is absentee voting. And it is legal, no matter what you're hearing from other people on the news or from other leaders that don't want you to use that method. And this is something that we should absolutely be utilizing during this pandemic. I contracted COVID-19 in early March and applied for my absentee ballot. And so we need to make sure that everybody who wants to cast a ballot can do so safely. You should not have to put your life at risk to cast your vote. And right now, as we see that Georgia is remaining a hot spot, we just saw news out of the White House um, this morning that we need to be looking at different precautions to take here in Georgia because of the pandemic and it's out of control because of the lack of leadership um, across the state to get the virus under control in a coordinated way. So voting by mail, we need to make sure that we are applying for our absentee ballots, helping us educate other people on how to apply for their absentee ballot. That is the safest way to vote in this pandemic. And it is absolutely legal in Georgia and you don't need an excuse to do so. There's even a portal online where you can go in and request your absentee ballot application. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. We love practical and real uh, solutions. And so, so you're saying whether you're in Georgia or in other states, you should request your ballot, your mail-in ballot right now. Well, there's, so there are time frames, and I know the Georgia law. I don't know the law across all states. But, um, and Jennifer, you might know this better for other states. But yes, you can go online. And then there are certain demographics. If you are disabled or if you're a senior citizen, where if you requested a ballot earlier, you should still receive that ballot throughout the election cycle. So each state has different laws. Um, that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to working on when I get to Congress is coordinated ways so that it does not matter where you live in this country, your right to vote should be the same across the board. But as of right now, each state um, has different laws on how you cast your ballot. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much. Jennifer Lampson, please do address the same thing. What are the real and practical ways that we can combat 
fight against this voter suppression that you so excellently laid out in so many different layers. You can start off with mail-in voting, you know, and, and um, providing clarity on that. And then let's go down the list. Yeah, um, a, a couple things. I'll start sort of at the sort of at the the national level. There there has been an effort um, ongoing in Congress to try and help states with making vote in person voting safer, providing protective gear and sanitizing equipment and supplies to poll workers, etc. Um, and uh, the, um, the Democrats in the House have passed, the House of Representatives have, has passed a, a, a relief, a COVID relief bill that included uh, $4 billion to provide states with support to um, get new equipment and um, facilitate transitioning to, to handling this surge of interest in vote by mail. Um, so far, the Congress, um, because of obstinance, um, mostly in the Senate, in the White House, they've, they have um, appropriated uh, 400 million of the, the needed 4 billion. Um, but there's still a possibility that they could come back in September and provide some of that funding to states that are struggling for many COVID related reasons right now. So one thing you can do is contact your US senators and ask them to support um, the needed funds, needed federal funds to states to bolster safe voting, safe in-person voting and vote by mail infrastructure um, as we head into the general election. Um, the second thing, similarly, co contact your senators and ask them to support uh, funding for the post office. Make sure that the post office has what they need, um, that they're gonna be able to hire overtime workers, that they're going to be able to, you know, staff up when they need to, um, to, to handle a surge of mail ballots. Um, that's very important as well. Um, but at the, at the, you know, at the sort of individual level, I think Senator Williams is right on. We are saying our, our, our mantra is know the rules and make a plan and do it as soon as you possibly can. Um, the rules are different everywhere. Um, there are a few websites that are kind of gather, sort of gathering that information. One of them is healthyvoting.org. It's a collaboration between the Pu National Public Health Association and the Center for Sec Tech and Civic Life. Um, so they have been sort of combining forces to make sure that accurate um, voter registration and deadlines for any state um, across the country can be accessed through that portal. That's one place to look. Um, if you don't find what you're looking for there, your secretary of state or your town elections clerk is another solid source of information. But find out and make a plan. This is not a year where we can just sort of think election day is November 3rd and I'm just gonna wake up on November 3rd and decide what to do. You gotta start thinking about it now. You gotta make a plan and you need to tell everybody you know. To, to be thinking about the election in this way. It's an election period, <laughs> not an election day. Um, so that's important. The, uh, the other thing I'll echo um, that Senator Williams said, volunteer. Um, there are election protection programs. Um, Protect the Vote um, is, uh, is a collaboration between uh, some 501c3 nonprofit organizations um, who are recruiting poll monitors. They, they have a hotline that does troubleshooting um, for people who run into trouble at the polls. Um, and poll workers, one of the reasons we've seen, a sh uh, we've seen um, trouble long lines um, and, um, and uh, polling places having trouble getting up and running is Due to, is due to COVID. Some of it's not orchestrated suppression. Some of it is COVID. People, the typical poll workers are often, um, you know, senior citizens. They're in the vulnerable category. They are worried about showing up in person to work in their traditional roles at the helping voters at the polls. Um, there's a great website um, and a, an ongoing recruitment campaign um, happening all across the country. That's called um, power the polls. 
Um, September 1st is, is coming right up and that is National Poll Worker Recruitment Day. We need to sort of bring in the cavalry this year to help um, local election officials run those um, elections as, 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 as well as possible. And, you know, they're all dealing with new, new um, processes with, and the surge of vote by mail, they need help. Um, so call your town clerk and find out what you can do to help. Uh, visit Power the Polls, visit Protect the Vote, visit HealthyVoting.org, get involved and share the information with everyone. Do it as soon as possible. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. And we do have people who have been asking questions in the chat. Um, uh, feel free to ask more questions. Some of, some of them we've already answered. Um, and we will provide uh, links to the websites that are being recommended. Um, they're so important. Um, before we actually get to questions from the audience, um, what, one of the things we wanted to do was showcase what recently happened, uh, especially because we're doing this in honor of John Lewis uh, and his legacy for the Voting Rights Act of 1965, is that we had a recent announcement relative to the Democratic um, pr presidential run. And that, as we know now, it, it will be Joe Biden running for president, as well as Kamala Harris as vice president. Um, and she actually said something very important in her opening speech and her first speech as the vice presidential nominee. So let's take a look at that clip. Pass a new Voting Rights Act, a John Lewis Voting Rights Act, that will ensure every voice is heard and every voice is counted. The civil rights struggle is nothing new to Joe. It's why he got into public service. It's why he helped reauthorize the Voting Rights Act and restore unemployment discrimination and employment discrimination laws. And today, he takes his place in the ongoing story of America's march toward equality and justice as only, as the only, as the only who has served alongside the first black president and has chosen the first black woman as his running mate. But as Joe always points out, this election is about more than politics. It's about who we are as a country. And I'll admit, over the past four years, there have been moments when I have truly worried about our future. But whenever I think that there is a reason for doubt, whenever I've had my own doubts, I think of you, the American people, the doctors and nurses and frontline workers who are risking your lives to save others. The truck drivers and the workers in grocery stores, in factories, in farms, working there, putting your own safety on the line to help us get through this pandemic. The women and students taking to the streets in unprecedented numbers. The dreamers and immigrants who know that families belong together. The LGBTQ Americans who know that love is love. People of every age and color and creed who are finally declaring in one voice that yes, black lives matter. That was excellent. Um, and so that was a historic moment, not just because Kamala Harris is the first black woman VP uh, Democratic candidate, or actually <laughs> not just Democratic candidate, any candidate, <laughs> but also because that idea of following up with a John Lewis Voting Rights Act um, would be absolutely amazing. Um, Senator Williams, do you want to address, you know, the clip that we just saw? Uh, if, if you, I know that you're, you're, you're literally getting ready to enter into this living history space um, on a, on a uh, electoral level, but what does that mean for you to be taking this space and then to hear Kamala Harris talk about the John Rights Voting Act? So I'm sorry, John Lewis Voting Act. <laughs> to have um, Senator Kamala Harris, um, an HBCU graduate, my sorority sister, um, standing up as the first Black woman to be in this position in the, the history of our country, and knowing that she, that I have the opportunity to be there during the first 100 days of this very historic administration and work on something so consequential 
to all of the issues that Jennifer led on this earlier that until we get this right and everybody's voice is able to be heard and votes are able to be counted, so many of the other issues that matter to us, we're not gonna be able to properly address because of um, the systemic ways that our votes are, are not counted and the gerrymandering that exists and the way that we're um, continuously suppressing people's votes and voices. And so to have her stand up there and listening to just, just having a moment with the history and understanding where we are in our country, how far we've came, but how very far we still have to go um, was something that I'm very much holding and looking forward to working with the voters in the fifth district to make sure that we get this right. Um, I am in a process now of introducing myself and getting feedback from voters across the district on what we wanna see and what they want to see because it is up to each generation to move the needle a little bit further. So it's not enough to just go and continue what we've done before or restore what we had before. We have to move the needle further in order to continue to progress in this country. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let us move to questions and answers. And um, I'm gonna see if Jennifer Lampson can have the first question. Um, I also just wanna really, really reemphasize to all of you all who are watching and participating, um, Jennifer's idea that this is an election period and it is not about election day. There's so many acts of voter suppression happening right now that we need you to get involved right now, even if you can't line up and go to the polls right now, there's something that you can do to make sure that you secure your own democratic right and those of others. So um, one of the first questions, uh, Jennifer, you can take this, but uh, and I, I think you did address it, but let's just reemphasize for those who uh, were unaware, can someone volunteer to be a poll worker or a poll watcher in another state? You know, that's, that's a good question. I don't know if you can, the, the rules are different for official poll workers. You have to go through the, you know, the, the official kind of election offices and that kind of thing. But, but um, poll monitoring, because so many activities are online this year, I think there are ways to volunteer um, for poll monitoring, troubleshooting. There's, I know one of the things that the election protection um, nonprofits are doing is they are monitoring social media uh, platforms for efforts to, to, to push out bad information, misinformation, which is, you know, unintentional bad information or disinformation, which is intentional um, wrong information that's intended to, you know, send people off in the wrong direction or delegitimize. So there, there are ways, I think, if you're interested in, you know, if you live in Massachusetts and you want to get, you know, you want to be, you want to, you want to put your time in um, somewhere else, there, there, there could well be ways for you to, for you to help. Um, but I would look, I would look close to home first. Um, start in your own community. And, you know, this is a, this is a, a different year where, especially due to COVID and because there have been a lot of changes in election rules, <clears throat> it's smart to pay attention to what is happening in your own community and be part of ensuring that your, your family, your friends, your colleagues, your whole network, um, be the person who, who makes sure that everybody has, has the information and that everybody is um, thinking about this as an election period. The election, the other thing about thinking about this is, as an election period um, is with, with this much mail-in voting, we, it is very likely that some races will not be called on November 3rd on election night. So when we think about election period, that means having some patience as well um, beyond November 3rd. I, I'm talking to you today from Washington State. I live in Seattle where we have universal vote by mail and we here have become accustomed to the fact that when you have mail ballots um, that, you know, people can submit. It just takes longer to count and process those. And so we're, we're used to not having the results on what we have typically understood as election night. We have, to, we have to wait. The counts come in over the, over a few days and we, 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 we are very likely to see that in contested race in contested races across the country. So be part of 
be part of spreading the word on that as well. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. And I'm thinking that for all of you all, um, I live in Pennsylvania, so I, we are a battleground state and we are always ready <laughs> you know, to, to do battle. But voter suppression has actually, when I think about it, has caused all 50 states to become battleground states because if your vote doesn't count, your vote doesn't count. So it's really important for all of us to be ready now and to be ready to do battle regardless of where we are because of voter suppression. And speaking of battleground states, um, Senator Williams, uh, a lot of questions have come in about how to hold the Secretary of State accountable. And this specific question is, during the Georgia primary, many people who requested their absentee ballot online never received it. How can we be sure that the Secretary of State will actually send out the general election ballots when he didn't earlier in the year? So two things here. Um, the best way to hold the Secretary of State accountable is making sure that we elect um, a new group of legislators so, because that's where the laws are made that give the Secretary of State his power. So this November, we have the opportunity to, um, to diversify, I'm gonna keep this as a nonpartisan space, to diversify who we um, send to, who is in our legislature to make the laws. Right now, the governorship, the Secretary of State, and um, both the State Senate and the State House are all Republican. And we know that we have redistricting coming up. We've seen all of the tactics that have been used against our right to vote. And it is imperative that we make sure that we are sending diverse voices down to the state capitol to hold them accountable. There are a number of elections bills that came up during the legislature this year, and many of them um, would have been detrimental to our right to vote, and we're able to stop them with a small vocal minority. So we have to keep raising our voices, that is number one. Um, number two is our local boards of elections have a lot to do with this. Um, we've been doing a mapping project across the state where we're working with um, local boards of elections who can send out absentee ballot requests on their own, not waiting for permission from the Secretary of State. And so that is another um, avenue. The other piece is I know how difficult it was to receive an absentee ballot for the primary election. I stood in line for five hours on the last day of early voting on June 5th on my 10 year wedding anniversary just to cast my vote because I never received my absentee ballot. So I, I feel your pain on this one and I understand. But one of the things that you can do in Georgia is you can go online to the Secretary of State's website um, and to the MVP website, the My Voter page, and you can actually track your absentee ballot. So I knew that they were showing that my absentee ballot was never even requested, which is why I went ahead and voted early. And you can track once it's turned in, if it's been counted, and that is another perk to voting early and voting by mail. You can't do that with election day voting, but you can absolutely track your ballot if you vote early um, in person or by mail in Georgia. Okay, thank you so much. So remember everyone, you can literally track your ballot in some states and per some technology, like you track your Uber Eats and your other food deliveries and other deliveries from you, UPS. Every step in the process. <laughs> track your ballot. Oh, these are great. These are things that people definitely wanna know. Um, and Jennifer, how important will drop boxes for absentee ballots be in this election? And how available will they be in particularly competitive states like Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, et cetera? That is a great question. Um, I, th I think drop boxes are very important. Our mantra, one of our mantras this year um, has been voters need to have options. We need to have a lot of safe voting options. Some people prefer to go in person, they need to have that option. People who are doing absentee mail ballots um, need to have the option for drop boxes that are, that are convenient. Um, and there, there are a lot of efforts afoot. I think that there is, there is an advocacy effort trying to get more drop boxes um, placed in Georgia. I know other states like Michigan and places there, there are ongoing efforts to try and work with um, the state government or the local elections officials to try and get more secure drop boxes placed in convenient locations um, so that, you know, it takes, a, it, it, it takes a little bit of the pressure off of the postal service um, and it's convenient. It's something people can do on their, um, you know, on their errands if it's 
in a shopping center parking lot or um, our, our drop box that I use is in front of our public library very centrally and they actually have a you can drive by it and pop it in the pop it in the slot um, and so drop I, yes I think drop boxes are key and it's it's not too late to, to keep advocating for drop boxes that's a that's a, a request that you can you can keep talking to your local and state officials about. Okay, thank you so much. So we're hearing all the positive aspects of drop boxes. Um, and someone has asked in this uh, next question is that they seem safe, you know, in each county, it seems safe, but what are the potential issues regarding these boxes? Um, they're saying that I can imagine the ability to cure any defects could be impacted. And it quite frankly, it made me think about um, old images of boxes of votes, you know, box, boxes of paper votes and things that were literally dumped in the river or held, you know, in storage containers and things like that, which as we know is not just illegal, but it's also another common effect of voter suppression. Jennifer, do you have any thoughts about what we do with regard to even those concerns and drop boxes and even the mail-in ballots? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you, you want to have a secure system of drop boxes and where drop boxes are being used. They are, you know, they're secure tamper proof boxes. I know here in Washington state, we also, we have poll workers, election workers who in the current situation are suited up with their PPE who are standing there overseeing the, the activity at the drop box. So um, it's got to be fully integrated in into the whole election, you know, electoral vote voting system. That's that's the key. Um, but they are, you know, if you if you do it right, they are they are secure. Um, you know, a lot of people pr would prefer to hand their ballot to their postal worker, and that's okay too. Or or drop it off at their city clerk's office. You, that's why you got to find out what the rules are and figure out what plan is going to work for you. If you don't feel comfortable with the drop box, go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And people can actually, in most, in most cities and states, you can actually take, if, if you're afraid of the drop box or even handing it over to a particular person, in most states, you can actually take your ballot down to the Board of Elections, right? And just show up in person with the ballot in hand, even early, during the proper early voting period, and literally hand it to someone in the Board of Elections, correct? In a lot of places, that's a, that's a, that's a question you would want to check on the local rules and regulations, but I, do, I know a lot of places do allow, they call, sometimes they call it in-person absentee voting, where you can drop off your absentee ballot with the, the, um, the clerk or the clerk of elections. Um, it's not always possible to deliver your absentee ballot to an in-person polling place on election day. That is not always possible. So you do, you really do have to find out what the, what the rules are in your location. All right. So be vigilant, everyone. Um, Senator Williams, someone asked, um, if we can register people to vote online here in Georgia, what is the website? <laughs> Do you know it offhand or do you have I a drop, I can drop it in the chat box. Okay, perfect. All right. I'll and then, put a link in the chat box. Okay, perfect. Um, and then actually back to you, Jennifer, sorry for overburdening you, but how does voter suppression specifically affect people with disabilities and what can we do in that, in, in that space? And then Senator Williams, if you have something specific to Georgia or Georgia law that addresses um, people with disabilities, let's, let's, let's discuss that. I think that's a really important question, um, and and it's a conversation that we don't talk about enough um, in in these kinds of in, in this in this work. Um, you know, there are many issues um, about access to ballots, translation issues, um, uh, accessibility issues at polling places. Um, in many ways, vote by mail is is a a, a good access access answer for um, the dis people with disabilities. Um, on the other hand, um, you need to have a ballot that works for people who, who, don't, who, who don't read and who don't write. So um, it's, uh, that is always something, those communities of people with disabilities, they have got to be part of the conversation. 
when the rules are being made. That there's just there's just no way around that. We have to center those needs in when we're making these when we're making these laws and when we're making the regulations and developing the systems. That there's just no other way to do it. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to give uh, each panelist an opportunity to take 60 seconds to give us some of their summary comments and their primary concerns or inspiration and information of what they, they've done an excellent job filling us with information and inspiration. Um, we'll start off with you, Jennifer Lamson uh, from Democracy Initiative. What, what, what are the most important things you want us to know and what should we do to fight voter suppression in this election? Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I'm going to keep banging the drum of three things. One, we are, we are witnessing orchestrated mass voter suppression. We've covered that today. Keep it in mind when you are seeing stuff. This is not, <laughs> this is not an accident. This is a strategic, <laughs> this is strategic stuff. And they are actually a, a, a lot of, a, a lot of the perpetrators of this suppression are quite open about they, they fear giving people access to the vote is going to mean that their side loses. Um, and um, so remember that um, these things are, are happening for a reason. Two, um, despite all of that, um, people are showing that they are highly motivated to vote. And it is our job to make sure that we know how to do it, that we share that information, and that we get out there um, and do it as early as possible. Um, so I think, and then the third thing is um, volunteer. Volunteer for election protection. Um, look into becoming a poll worker. Um, be, be, take, your, take your participation as a citizen to the next level. This is the year to do it. Thank you so much. And State Senator and uh, uh, upcoming Congresswoman Nakima Williams, who is literally taking the space of John Lewis, um, what do you have to share with us about you know, your main points relative to fighting voter suppression in this election? I say check, check, check to all of the things that Jennifer said, volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. If you can be a poll watcher, become a poll watcher. If you can volunteer some time to be um, an election protection monitor, sign up to do so. The best way to combat voter suppression is getting involved and going to vote yourself and encouraging and educating other people to do so. Democracy doesn't start and stop on election day and that's never been more true here in a pandemic when we have to start this process before we get to the actual election day. So remain vigilant. We're going to get through this and we can do it together. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you all um, who have been watching. Thank you for those who've been participating. Uh, you have been joining us on how to fight against voter suppression by the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. And we are so appreciative of you and all of you for securing our democracy and trying to make us a more perfect union. We can do it. Let's fight back. Every vote counts. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Goddess. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ellis, for moderating today. Uh, Senator Williams, thank you so much for being uh, with us and good luck in Washington. And uh, Jennifer, I would say the same good luck in Washington, but on the other side of the country, um, thank you so much for your insight today. I truly appreciate it. Um, a few ways that you can get involved um, is uh, here are some actions um, from our weekly action checklist. Be sure that you're registered to vote. Um, we have links to how to do that in the chat. Um, join the new Georgia Projects agenda for young Georgians. Uh, this gives uh, young people a opportunity to volunteer to become poll workers and to ensure that their communities are registered to vote and know when and where they need to be to do so, as well as requesting that absentee ballot. Um, also, uh, join us and be an ambassador for the Campaign for Equal Dignity. Uh, you can check that out at equaldignity.org. We do have uh, some upcoming programs. Um, oops. Uh, we are partnering with Equitable Dinners, um, Lift Every Voice, and the next one is coming up on August 16th. 
Uh, if you haven't gone to one of those before, absolutely check it out. Uh, there is a uh, special drama that uh, is written specifically for these in the beginning, and then you have a chance to discuss it. Um, we also have a program on August 21st first called Educational Disparities and the Unequal Burden. Uh, it's at noon. Um, please join us for that. Also, uh, coming up next Wednesday, uh, we have rigged uh, the Voter Suppression Playbook. If you enjoyed the conversation today, absolutely check out our website so you can um, find out how to uh, screen the film before we have the panel on um, Wednesday, August 19th. Uh, with our film festival, um, we will end it on September 9th with John Lewis, Good Trouble. Uh, same thing, you can access the film ahead of time and then uh, join us for the panel. Once again, thank, ev thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ellis, Senator Williams, and Jennifer Lamson. We so appreciate your time and the incredible insight that you brought today. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.